and welcome. No other night of the year quite equals this one, does it? Anticipation, excitement, love, peace, joy, hope, 
are experienced in these hours of Christmas Eve by more people than at any other time of year. And it is to God we give the glory for this celebration. And it is God who has created this night. It is God who gave us the gift of Jesus, whom we worship and praise tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you to the staff, tech crew, and others who have worked so hard to make this live stream experience possible. We are so glad to welcome you this evening and invite you to join us for online worship on Sundays each week. Classic, New Day praise, and youth worship. As we worship, celebrate, and sing, we hope that you will connect with God. shepherd, lamb of God. He is the babe of Bethlehem and the mighty Lord. His name is called Savior, author of life. Bread of life, the light of the world. He is called friend and guide. And we call him everlasting life, prince of peace. The one who brings love to each of us and all of us. 
with joyous and thankful praise, we worship the with us God. The birth of Jesus is foretold, reading from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word and the angel departed from her.
The Birth of Jesus, reading Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Angels invite shepherds to visit baby Jesus. Reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. 
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to to Bethlehem to see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Magi, wise men, visit Jesus. Reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, 
for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. and peace to you. We've read part of the Christmas story from Matthew's gospel. Some of the unique things about Matthew. Matthew was written for Jewish readers. He is demonstrating that Jesus is the promised Messiah. The waiting is over. Matthew quotes the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, a lot. We live in the real world in Matthew's gospel. If Mark wants us to be alert and prepared, Matthew gives us the real world into which Jesus comes. Some of the major themes in Matthew, we find the reality of Jesus, the fulfillment of prophecy as Messiah, and we learn that worshiping Jesus is a choice for each of us now today. We often clean up Christmas and dress it up, and it looks uh, rather otherworldly, unattainable. I bet something like this sounds familiar. It's about 2,000 years ago, the evening of December 25th. Mary rides into Bethlehem on a donkey, urgently needing to deliver her baby. Although it's an emergency, all the innkeepers turn them away, so they deliver baby Jesus in a stable. Then angels sing to shepherds. Afterwards, they all join three kings with camels in worshiping the newborn king. Now, this is a a collage, a collection, a mashup, if you will, of what Matthew and Luke share of the story. But Matthew's Christmas story is set in the real world, as we mentioned, a broken, bruised, sinful, conflicted world. God meets us in this messy world and gives us what we need and want the most, Emmanuel. There are many sweet and beloved characters in the Christmas story. Mary, shepherds, an angel choir, Elizabeth, Zechariah. In Matthew's Christmas story, we also get the visit of the wise men, Magi. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be all acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. He's central. In all the nativity scenes you see, Jesus is front and center, right? So where do you see the Magi in nativity scenes? Close to the manger? Behind shepherds? Off to the side? Where do you put them in your nativity at home? The Magi are important to the story, not just for a week or so after Christmas when we're ready to move on to New Year's. Look at the Magi in this glass nativity. It's beautiful. Among other things, Matthew may have been wanting us to see that Jesus was not simply the Jewish Messiah, but the Savior and King for the entire world. Most likely, the Magi came from Persia. And by the way, Magi is the root of our word magician, Uh, These magi probably were not magicians in the way we think of them. Uh, They were likely part of a priestly class in another religion very different from Judaism. Based on their title in the Bible, that word magi in the original language, they were respected court advisors, scholars, sages, uh, devout believers in God, and scientists of a sort. They studied the stars and looked to them for signs of God's plans and for world events. They were astrologers in a time when astrologers did more than create horoscopes. They were were serious students of the stars. This is why I find the visit of the Magi so remarkable. According to Matthew, God chose to invite a group of foreigners, priests of a different religion, to share in the joy of Jesus' birth. And God used them to to provide what would prove to be much-needed help for the Holy Family. See, the Holy Family would soon be forced to run away from Herod's murderous paranoia when he decided that was the only way to kill this newborn rival king that he heard about. He decided the only way to do away with Jesus was to kill all the baby boys that age. The Holy Family would have to run for their lives as refugees to Egypt. The gold, frankincense, and myrrh would have given them plenty of resources to safely make this trip to Egypt. Because they saw the star and deduced that the king of the Jews had been born, uh, these magi traveled 1,200 miles across the ancient highways from Persia to Judea in order to see the child, bringing him gifts and to worship him. Right here at the beginning of the gospel story, we find God doing something unusual. God not only reaches out to, but also uses people of other faiths to accomplish his purposes. God is making it clear that Jesus is for all people, Jews, Gentiles, me, and you. What an awesome God. The star guided the Magi. A star can be seen by everyone, Jew, Gentile, all over the world, everybody. God leads us all. God guides us all as well. To what? And more importantly, to whom? (laughs) To the Lord. The Lord has moved in. Jesus is the incarnation of God. That's how God moves in. Incarnation is a fancy word of theology. Incarnation is the central theological affirmation. It's the central truth of Christmas, that God came to us, that God took on flesh, this enfleshment of God in Jesus to walk among us. See, Jesus doesn't just represent God as you or I would, as ambassador or emissary, but but in Jesus, God's very self, complete self, walked and lived among us. In Adam Hamilton's book, uh, The Walk, he wrote, When God sought to speak to the human race to disclose who God is and who God calls us to be, he did not send a book. He sent a person. Jesus was God's word, God's message wrapped in human flesh. 
Jesus is God incarnate. God's desire to be known, to speak to us, to be heard by us. Jesus is God's presence made flesh. King, Savior, Emmanuel, light of the world. It's no one less than the Lord who is here. Incarnation. Who is he to you? A heartwarming fable? A seasonal religious accessory? Back to the Magi. Remember the glass nativity with the Magi? Uh, Take another look at those. Our nativity like that sat in our uh, dining room a Christmas long ago. And as I would walk through that part of the house and I'd see that nativity, I would notice that one of the Magi, one of the wise men, was turned away from Jesus. And I would turn him back around to face the baby Jesus and go on my way. And Then a few days later, I'd come back, and once again, he was turned away. Come to discover the vibration of our footfalls had turned him away. The, the pedestal below him was not perfectly level, and uh, the, the walking through the house uh, teetered him just a bit away from Jesus. The busyness of our traffic often turns us away from Jesus. But he's right here. Emmanuel, the Lord, present in this very real world. Magi were tempted by a choice to save themselves by betraying Jesus to Herod, turn away, or risk worshiping and protecting the baby. And this risk with Herod was very real. This ruthless, paranoid killed three of his own sons. The king, the savior, Emmanuel, the light of the world, is here. All the sights and sounds of the season have led us here, just like the star led the magi. And you have a choice, too. Joseph Parker wrote, There are others who do not come to worship Christ, who simply come to speculate upon him, the patronage they offer the Son of God. It makes me sad to hear how they condemn Christ with faint praise. What I dread among you is not that you will destroy Christ, but that you will patronize him. Jesus Christ is nothing to me if he is not the Savior of the world. No one can entertain an opinion of indifference regarding Jesus. If we have considered the subject at all, we must worship Christ or crucify him. Where there is earnestness in the inquiry or the criticism, that earnestness ends in worship or in crucifixion. C.S. Lewis suggested that there are only three choices for Jesus laid before us. Either he was a liar when he said he was the Son of God, or he was deranged, a lunatic. He was either a liar, a lunatic, or Jesus is the Lord. Don't let the busyness and the boxes and your own footfalls dissuade or distract you from what's central. Let the season and the celebrations help you to see Jesus. Let the love and the lights guide you to recognize and worship the Lord who is born, who is here, who does not turn his back on you, but is attentive to you and your life needs. Kneel with the Magi, and millions over the millennia to worship the Lord, Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for guiding us, guiding us in so many ways to what is central, your son Jesus. We, we give our lives in worship and in service. Guard us and guide us, all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we join in Christmas worship, celebrating the birth of God's only Son, I encourage you to celebrate Jesus every day. Our work is to glorify God, and we do this with our gifts of praise, with music and voice, our service, 
and our financial gifts. They also make an impact on the world around us and those in need. All of our Christmas Eve offerings and gifts will be used to meet the needs of the children's and family of people right here in the Plainfield area. Just mark your special Christmas gift, Christmas Eve. You can find all the ways you can make a financial gift at pumc.org forward slash give. Because God gives, we give. Thank you for your generosity. As we come to Holy Communion this evening, I want to make special note that as a United Methodist congregation, we practice an open table. That means that all persons of all ages, yes, even kids with parents' good guidance, uh, people of all ages and all faith backgrounds are welcome and invited to fully participate at the Lord's table where Jesus is the host. We invite you to be attentive to all of our conversation and prayer around Holy Communion here as part of your worship. Uh, wherever you're worshiping with us, uh, please use any cracker or grain or bread that you have and, and any juice or grape juice or juice whatsoever, even water, with enough for everyone at your location. Uh, be prepared to receive the bread and then the cup together in a few moments as uh, I'll give clear instruction. Holy Communion, uh, the bread and the drink, it's an outward and visible sign of, of an inward and spiritual grace. It represents something good that God does in us and for us. It brings us into union with Christ and into union and fellowship with each other. Uh, we will share uh, the prayer of great thanksgiving, as it's called, this special table grace. We'll share this prayer in an ancient first century way, face to face, eyes open. And I'll ask you to repeat one word after me whenever you hear me say it, that word being amen. And so we pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this celebration tonight. Thank you, God, for the joy that we share, the hope that is uh, inspired within us. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you, God, most of all for your uh, audacious, outrageous plan to live among us in Jesus, fully divine and fully human. You live among us in this way, God. It's the fulfillment of your promise. Amen. We celebrate your son Jesus tonight, gracious God. We remember his birth and his life, his teaching, his healing ministry, the way he blessed so many, his death on the cross, his new life from the grave, and his continued life among us now. Amen. And tonight we also remember how your son Jesus was at supper with his disciples on the night he gave himself up for us. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, shared it with his followers saying, take and eat this, it is my body broken for you. Eat this to remember me. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, shared it with his friends, saying, Drink from this, all of you, because this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and countless others for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this to remember me. Amen. Gracious God, thank you for these gifts of the bread and the cup. As we receive them this evening, help them to be for us the body, the blood, the presence of your son Jesus, that we might come to live with him in love and in grace. Amen. Friends, please recognize the gifts of God for all of God's people everywhere. Amen. Now, if... Uh, we will remember Jesus took the bread and broke it. Amen. This is the body of Christ broken for you. 
And Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, God, and we give thanks. Amen. And now if you will take the cracker, brain, or grain, or bread that you have and prepare to eat it when I do. This is the body of Christ broken for us. Now, if you will take the juice or water that you have and drink it when I do, this is the blood of Christ shed for us. And God's people said, Amen. and loving God, thank you for your many gifts to us. Thank you for the crowning gift of your son, Jesus. We pray to receive him with faith, with hope, and with love so that we may know your grace, your peace, and your hope. All in Jesus' name. Amen. Lighting candles on Christmas Eve has long been a tradition for many people and many congregations. The candles represent for us, on this night especially, the light of God come into the world in the person, the child, even, of Jesus. In a few moments, we will take the light from the central candle, from the Christ candle, and begin to pass it one person to another. If you have candles at home, feel free to join us. And you may want to take a moment now to go ahead and grab candles. In anticipation of the light, we will first darken the sanctuary, and it will get very dark. Please remain patient during the darkness, and listen and wait for the light to break in.
We have learned about it in new ways this year, darkness. The darkness of pandemic persists. And with it, we've experienced the isolation and the depression. There's been economic darkness with so many jobs lost. There's been the darkness of all the illnesses and so many deaths. The darkness has persisted this year. Deadly natural disasters. There's been ideological and political divisions and disagreements. Racial injustice. In almost every corner of our lives, we've experienced disrupted relationships. And why does Christmas come when there's the fewest hours of daylight in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, long ago, when Christians first came to be interested in the birth of Jesus, people could no longer remember exactly when he was born. So they selected December 25th. And at the time, the world was using the Julian calendar. And on the Julian calendar, December 25th was the longest night, the winter solstice. Greatest number of dark hours, fewest number of light hours. Well, in the 16th century, the world changed to the Gregorian calendar. The date of Christmas remained the same, December 25th, but on that different calendar, the winter solstice came to be on December 21st, as we know it today. But why set Christmas on the winter solstice anyway, in the first place? Well, it's as if the heavens themselves proclaim the coming of light. You see, the winter solstice is the turning point when we gradually get more hours of daylight each day and fewer hours of darkness. The heavens themselves proclaim that light triumphs over darkness. Daylight pushes out the night. As the Bible says in John's Gospel about the light of Christ, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot put it out. God brings the light of the world. The light of a star guided the Magi. Let the light guide you to your next steps in life, whatever that may be. Let the light dispel the shadows in your life. Let the light guide you to worship the Lord. God brings Jesus, the light of the world, the light that brings life, the light that banishes all of our darkness. Recognize it now. See it now. The light of Christmas, the light of Christ.
God gave us the greatest gift, the King of Kings, the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us, the light of the world. God gave us the greatest gift, God's very self, unconditional love in Jesus. Recognize and receive the Lord Jesus. Merry Christmas. Amen.